In 1968, Norm Jewison directed and produced The Thomas Crown Affair. This heist film was nominated for two Academy Awards, one being Best Original Song by Michelle Legrand for The Windmills of Your Mind. The story is about a millionaire businessman, Thomas Crown, played by Steve McQueen, and how he pulls off the perfect crime. He robs a Boston bank of almost $3 million by orchestrating four men to do the dirty work for him. And then a fifth guy drives the getaway car and takes the money that was taken from the bank and deposits it in a cemetery trash can. Crown keeps his distance from all these people that are involved and never meets any of them face to face. Nor do they know each other before the robbery. Crown comes up and retrieves the money from the trash can after he follows the driver of the getaway car into the cemetery. He then makes several trips to Switzerland and deposits all the money there, but spaces those deposits out so he wouldn't draw attention to himself by doing it all at one time. Faye Dunaway plays insurance investigator Vicki Anderson. She's contracted to investigate the heist, and upon recovering the stolen money, she'll get 10% of it. She immediately, almost intuitively, recognizes that he is the mastermind behind the robbery. Crown doesn't need the money at all. He's very wealthy. He just loves doing it for the thrill of the crime. It's a game to him. Faye Dunaway's character lets him know that she is aware that he's the thief, and she intends to prove it. A cat and mouse game starts up, but it's pretty obvious that the two people are attracted to each other from the very beginning. An affair develops, and this complicates Vicky's vow to find the money and to help the detectives solve the crime and bring the guilty party to justice. Vicky starts closing in on him by using the IRS as leverage against his liquid assets. She tries to work a deal with law enforcement, but the detectives refuse to deal. In an effort to find out if Vicky is really on his side and that she truly loves him, he organizes another robbery exactly like the first, with different accomplices pulling the job off. He also tells Vicky where the drop is going to be. The robbery is successful, but there are gunshots, and the viewer is left with the impression that there may have been some people killed, which raises the stakes considerably. Knowing that the robbery has been pulled off, the police and Vicky stake out the cemetery where the drop is going to be made. After the drop is made, they wait for Thomas to arrive so they can arrest him. His Rolls Royce pulls in, and you think it's him coming to retrieve the money, but it's not. He sent a messenger in his place with a telegram asking Vicky to bring the money with her and to join him, and if she doesn't want to, to keep the car. She tears the telegram to bits and throws the pieces up in the air as she gazes up to the sky with tears in her eyes as Crown flies away in a jet. Steve McQueen loved making this film. He said it's one of the favorite of his career. He undertook all his own stunts, which included playing polo and driving the dune buggy at a real high speed along the coastline. One of the more noteworthy aspects of the film is its use of split screen in the opening sequence, and you see it used throughout the film. Some have claimed that it was an example of style over content, but I don't see it that way. It's a way of jamming a lot of information into a single shot. It's very well done, and the real reason it was first adopted was because the video editor Hal Ashby was trying to reduce the running time of the opening. It worked so well in that sequence, they adopted it for uses later on in the film. Sean Connery had originally been the choice for the title role, but he declined it because he was completely exhausted from filming You Only Live Twice. He later regretted that decision. Faye Dunaway's breakthrough movie, Bonnie and Clyde, hadn't come out yet when she was cast in May for this film. Steve McQueen used to joke with her and referred to her as Dunn Fadeaway. All this was done without him being aware 
that she would become an overnight sensation that summer after Bonnie and Clyde came out. The producers applied to the FBI for help in shooting the picture, and they sought to film the FBI headquarters in Boston, but the agency refused them, claiming that the script made it look like they were incompetent. The Ferrari that's driven by Faye Dunaway and that's being referred to as one of those Italian things is actually the first of only 10 of those cars made. The Ferrari 275 GTB, this one had a serial number of 09737. Steve McQueen was so impressed with the car, he wanted one for himself. He eventually ended up with the serial number 10453. That car is today with a collector in New York. The dune buggy was a Meyer Mannix built in California on a VW Beetle with a hopped-up Chevrolet Corvair engine. That original dune buggy was often copied. Crown's two-door Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow carried a Massachusetts vanity license that read TC-100 for the film. The one-minute kissing sequence between the two leads took about eight hours to film over a number of days. But bear in mind, this is not the sexiest part of the film. This takes place when the two characters sit down to a chess game. The camera is focused on both of them in close-up shots that alternates back and forth, starting with the initial concept that they're continually trying to outthink the other. The game progresses, and so does the flirting that Vicky does with Thomas. This long sequence is considered one of the sexiest and most sensual scenes that has ever been filmed in Hollywood. And what makes it more amazing is the fact that they're fully dressed and they're sitting across the table from each other an arm's length apart. If you've never seen this sequence, the movie is worth watching just for this scene. When the theme song, Windmills of Your Mind, won the Academy Award for Best Original Song, singer Noel Harrison was unable to attend the ceremony to perform it. He had another commitment on a different film that he was working on. Singer and guitarist Jose Feliciano stood in for him instead. The writer, Alan Trussman, got the idea for the film while he was working in a bank where he spent most of his idle moments imagining how one could rob it. The initial bank robbery was filmed at the downtown branch of the National Shawmut Bank and that although guards and bank officials knew what was really going on, the customers didn't because the filmmakers used concealed cameras to film it. Although they apparently thought that a real robbery was occurring, none of the customers or pedestrians interfered in any way. That bank lobby where the first robbery took place was turned into a restaurant in the early 1970s. Another standout for the film is that in the evening, when Vicki meets Crown, she smokes a Virginia Slim cigarette. These cigarettes had just been introduced at the same time that the film was being made. The narrow profile cigarette was considered to be a very classy way to smoke. In some people's minds, this film is somewhat dated now, as far as heist movies go. But it was pretty hot stuff when it was released back in 1968. Take a look back at this movie. I think you'll enjoy it. I love it. It's a crackerjack story that's well-tooled, professionally crafted, and bears one of the sexiest scenes that's ever been filmed in Hollywood. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.